Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the regular school committee meeting for the Little Common School Committee of April 13th, 2022. Everyone could please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And requested that we offer a moment of silence at this time, please. Thank you. I, I'm going to um, just offer that um, from now on, I think we will be streaming, not doing live Zooms. That's on me um, at the agenda meeting. We discussed it and um, I didn't consider looping Jonathan into the conversation and I should have. And so we just said that we were gonna do in person and didn't even consider streaming. So um, when it was brought to my attention by Jonathan, we were within the 48 hour time frame too that we need, would need to have posted it. So this will be recorded and posted on, yep. I guess I'm not telling anyone they know if they're reading, um, watching, but just so you guys know, next time it'll be live streamed without comments. It'll just be a stream, not a Zoom webinar. So if, if I may, so it's pre-pandemic framework. Live, yeah. Yeah. In person and videotape for those um, who want to catch it afterwards and or live streamed for those who want to observe. Yeah. Awesome. Great, thank you. Um, next up is the consent agenda. Would anyone like to pull anything out? Motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? And carries. Um, number three, spotlight wellness week. If I may, Jack. McKinnon was going to be here read all about wellness week. The kids are at Buck Hill, our eighth graders. They're doing their colonial camping, their um, 18th century camping, 1700s. And um, he arrived late in the day, still unshaven and, and in his G. He was in Buck Hill mode. So I said, I will read your reports tonight. Go home and see your family. Um, and I'll touch on Buck Hill in a few minutes. Um, but Wellness Week, as usual, uh, seems to be getting better and better. And I will do the part that impacted our children. And Carolyn, our HR uh, coordinator, will focus on the Wellness Week uh, initiatives that the staff um, enjoy, including massages. Uh, so this is from Jack McKinnon and Noelle Kiernan, who um, pretty much organized everything that week with the help of the district HR coordinator. Wellness week was a big success. Students participated in activities focusing on the three sides of the health triangle, as well as making good choices and goal setting. We still have an ongoing food drive at the PST until the end of the month, which ended already. They had over 1,000 items to donate to the local food bank. The Katie Brown uh, Education Project also visited the school virtually. Grades four through eight um, students were involved with that in discussing healthy relationships. Students in grades six, seven, and eight created posters depicting healthy relationships in advisory that week and entered them into the Lindsay Ann Burke Foundation poster contest. Wellness week activities for the children included um, nutrition, Topics on nutrition, uh, being active, getting enough sleep. It also focused on their mental and emotional uh, health and um, activities around mindfulness and meditation, gratitude, dealing with feelings and self-affirmation. And it also focused on topics dealing with social health, being a good friend, interactions with family, school and community members, being thoughtful of others, random acts of kindness for those in need. In addition, the health curriculum 
upgrade for grades K through four is in full swing and finished up recently for grades um, K through four and is now um, actuated in grade five, grades five through eight. And by the end of the school year, uh, our health and PE cohort, Mr. Ford and Ms. Kiernan, will uh, begin the PE curriculum writing. And um, all of that will also include international baccalaureate um, concepts and framework. So by the end of next year, we will have a fully um, reset, renewed, updated health and physical education curriculum for the first time in more years than I want to admit on camera. Uh, <laughs> um, Ms. Kiernan and Mr. Ford uh, will be attending PD on May 11th, um, and that will be focusing on the national health education standards, and that will be off-site location to be determined. Regarding recess rocks, Noel uh, Kiernan has a meeting set up with Jesse Jasper uh, on the 14th, which is tomorrow, to discuss how our recess is going, any problems, wants, needs. Teachers' assistants receive an email each Monday with resources from Playworks and keep playing. So that's the update from our health and PE teachers and what occurred. Oh, and also the children, this was new this year. A new activity was a gratitude bag, and there was also one for the adults. We could write what we were grateful for and put it in the bag. Um, participated in that. I, I hope a lot of others did. Each day, our students and teachers wrote down one thing that they were thankful for and placed it in the gratitude bag. The kids in their homeroom, the staff in the faculty prep room. Uh, it can be a person, a place, an object, or experience. Taking time to be thankful for something can actually rewire a part of the brain. So we had a great week of wellness. Um, we had a food drive for a little Compton bag with over a thousand items. And um, the kids seemed to love dressing up. One day it was, you know, they dressed up the colored vegetables and so on and so forth. And next we have our HR coordinator extraordinaire talking about some of the adult supports and activities that were in place for that week. Mm, thank you. You're welcome. For the staff wellness this year, we focused on positivity and phytonutrients. Phytonutrients are plant compounds that help keep us healthy. Since their unique benefits are identified by color, we aligned the phytonutrient information provided each day with the color of the day that tied back to what the students were doing. Based on information about positive psychology, every day a small change that can ripple outward and create lasting positive change was also presented to the staff. We had mindfulness and meditation, which of course helps you focus on your task at hand. Staff members were reminded of their free gift of headspace, which was given to them at the beginning of the year. Journaling allows your brain to relive a positive experience. Small journals and pens were offered to every staff member. Random acts of kindness a variety of seed packets were offered to all staff members as a reminder to spread the seeds of positivity. Additionally, the school held a food drive that week to fill the local food pantry and ended up with nearly 1,000 items collected. As Lori mentioned, gratitude was a big part of the week. Writing down three things that you're grateful for every day trains your brain to start scanning the world for the positives first. A gratitude bag was placed in each staff room so that members could jot down and share their thoughts of thanks. And finally, exercise. It teaches the brain that behavior matters. On Friday, we had a very popular giveaway of exercise bands, jump ropes, pedometers, and fun balls for all staff. Over the past few years, Wellness Week has included infused water. It started with Water Wednesday that participate in. Every staff member has been provided with their own infuser water bottle, it's like this. And this refreshing tradition continued this year. Thanks to the help of Chartwell's cafeteria staff, a special fruit and herb blend was created every day of Wellness Week. Uh, this year's favorites were orange pineapple and watermelon lime. All staff members had free salads available to them daily for lunch with a protein, fruit, and choice of dressing. Taco Tuesdays, which the kids turned into talk about at Tuesdays, lunch was also free for staff. 
The superintendent brought in healthy breakfast items on Thursday, <laughs> excuse me, to nourish staff members, minds, bodies, and souls. <laughs> and on <laughs> Friday, which was wear purple for protein, assorted quiches were served for breakfast in the staff room. But I would have to say the highlight of the week was when the PST sponsored a massage therapist. Staff members were able to sign up for 15 minute chair massages throughout the day. So I think we may be onto a new tradition for staff wellness week. Um, when this was reported out at the last wellness meeting, um, Corinne Weatherall from the Rhode Island Healthy Schools Coalition contacted me and Noelle and asked us for some information. And she did a little write up in the Healthy Schools Coalition newsletter for April, spotlighting uh, Wilbur's Wellness Week. So that's for rounding out there if you're interested. I had another district contact me about that and saying, really? hey, yeah, congratulations. Ah. <laughs> Great. Great. So if anyone has any thoughts or ideas, we're already starting to plan next year. I don't want to ruin any surprises. <laughs> Can I come for a massage? <laughs> <laughs> massage. It was a line. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That was very popular. I would say yeah, there are silver linings with this um, awful um, pandemic. And, and one of them is the ramping up of Wellness Week. Um, it just becomes so, um, it comes at the perfect time. March is the cruelest month. <laughs> and so uh, it just, it really has taken on a life of its own. And um, Noelle Kiernan and Carolyn, it's just a perfect uh, partnership of building and district to launch this. And the PST was wonderful as well. And it also coincided with Queen, uh, Read Across America. And so there were all sorts of little speaking comments on it as well. And then um, the book, fair sort of happened um, within a few days. So it was just a fun week uh, in a bleak month, you know, brown weather. <laughs> Great, thank you both. Um, next up, to for update on the 2021-2022 school year. Oh, excellent. Um, it's been a really good school year, I have to say. I think we'll talk about the immediate right now, and that is our kids that are at Buck Hill, all of our um, eligible eighth graders. And we have uh, a record number of staff members cycling in and out. And I want to just give them um, a high five. Mr. Heilman, I think he's been sleeping there all three nights. Mr. Ford, Mr. DeLeo, Mr. Kirby, Mr. McKinnon, Ms. Lotz, Ms. Wardell, she's our nurse sub, as well as Nurse Dunn. Mr. Tommaso, Ms. Miller, Ms. Giles, our literacy specialist, Ms. Vendry, our computer teacher, um, our tech teacher, and Ms. DiGiulio, our student assistance counselor. They have been cycling in and out uh, since Monday, sleeping there. Um, and the, the field trip weather gods have definitely been smiling on them the past two days, but not so much Monday night and into yesterday morning. I saw some of the pictures, you know, it's all good. Um, <laughs> but all small than info, um, they will be back tomorrow. When the field trip was brought to me with um, a change from the last 45 years for a third night, it was always three days and two nights, I was hesitant. It's like, okay, this is April. Um, and, you know, this could be really wonky in terms of weather. And, and I did agree to it. They gave me a nice, you know, pretty good rationale, pretty strong rationale. Um, and I'm glad I did because the first day that the kids are getting acclimated, they're excited, the adrenaline's pumping, and they're building new neural pathways that were never built because they um, were always on screens. And so the first day, because the screens are not allowed, first day is um, basically they're detoxing from technology. And so I heard that none of them really slept and the adults didn't. And then yesterday they hit the ground running. They had a great breakfast, the principal flipping um, pancakes and so forth. And then they were busy all day um, doing their lean twos and all the other stuff. And then by the evening, they were sort of getting into a groove into this sort of natural world, um, building those new pathways <laughs> that have been stunted from so much screen time since birth. And, and then today, they, you know, they, they definitely peaked at that learning curve and now. Um, 
you know, they're pretty much acclimated. So I'm wondering if, if this continues this trip, it should always be three days. Um, otherwise you're just learning and then boom, you're coming back and time for synthesis. So anyway, they're having a great time, um, which is awesome. Last week we had um, RICAS uh, ELA um, testing. And I, I've said this before, even though we knocked it out of the park last year, we are uh, a school of small numbers, which means we're very vol you know, it's a very volatile data point. So we can't always pin our hopes on being in the top five, et cetera, every year. But um, by all accounts, all of our students worked so hard. I heard the same thing last year. And teachers saying, my God, I can't believe, I just can't believe how much they did. And um, the proof is in the pudding, you know, that they did so well and that we had ride on campus a few weeks ago to shoot some, to capture some video footage of our students learning and our teachers teaching, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Last week, thank you, Chair, you participated. We had 22 members of our school community get uh, certified in CPR, uh, AED, and first aid and uh, after school on their own time. And so that is always nice to see staff in the element. Everyone had jeans on. Uh, we all had our uh, you know, Red Cross um, toys to play with, and it was really uh, nice to see that happen. Our third term report, guys can't believe, we have one more term left. We'll be going home with our students tomorrow, April 14th, and um, we have a talent show coming up, May 4th, three to five, uh, May 2nd, let's see, on Tuesday, May 2nd, and Thursday, May 4th. Um, practice will be held the following, let's see, blah, blah, blah. Okay, there'll be tryouts for the talent show coming up. And this is huge. Our talent show the past two years has been virtual. So our kids are really excited. Um, I hear someone is doing stand-up comedy, et cetera. And so that'll be a lot of fun. And the show date is Friday, May 13th from 6.30 to 8. So mark your calendars. This will be the first time in three years that our talent show is in person. Uh, Matilda, we are also, as usual, launching a huge production, musical production, Miss Oriole and Company, and that is taking place Friday, June 3rd um, at 6 and Saturday, June 4th at 4 in the McGregor Gymnasium here on campus. Once again, we had to forego uh, for two years in a row our musical, and this year we will be um, staging quite the extravaganza. And I don't know if, I don't think we discussed our science fair award winners at the last meeting. Okay, five Wilbur McMahon eighth grade students were recognized for their brilliant work at the 2022 Rhode Island Science and Engineering Fair last month. Two of them finished in the top 10 of nearly 100 students from private and public middle schools throughout the state. Two scholars from our small corner of the world. Kudos to all Wilbur McMahon students who participated at the school and state levels. And of course, to Ms. Brazil, uh, the seventh and eighth grade science teacher who's instrumental every year in organizing and overseeing this annual event. One of our scholars, Mays Miller, uh, won both the Narragansett Bay Commission Award and the Coastal Resources Management Council Award. How fitting for Little Compton Coastal Scholar. Um, and our grant award winners were uh, Mays Miller, first grant, Colby Nixon, first grant, uh, Max Fraioli, third grant, James Martram, best and fair finalist, Tim Roberts, best and fair finalist, and Broadcom Masters Qualifiers Junior Division National Competition um, qualifiers, James Markstrom and Tim Rock, Timothy Roberts. This is huge. We've had um, two kids in the top 10 and uh, five students rack up a, a goodly number of awards. Um, it's so very proud of them. Also, uh, I received a press release a few weeks ago from Wright, Rhode Island, announcing that Wilbur McMahon School seventh grader Marjorie Leary, we call her JoJo, uh, whose specialty is fiction, was fetched at a special awards ceremony alongside with other writing competition winners in Newport at the Newport Art Museum uh, on April 3rd. Um, 
Marjorie's story, Goodbye Esper, has received a notable mention in the Wright Rhode Island Short Fiction Competition and will be published by Wright Rhode Island in a special anthology. So, you know, we've had some challenging few years. However, our scholars are truly making their mark and putting a beautiful corner of the world um, on the map. And so whether it's arts, sciences, math, and ELA, our students are achieving at high levels. Uh, so Little Compton, as we move into the financial town meeting um, next month, they can rest assured that their tax dollars are uh, being maximized. And that is my spiel. I do have something to share with each of you. And this is the budget message. And you may have been saw, Roger. Um, this is the budget, budget message that goes in the town financial um, meeting packet, the flyer, the mailer that is sent everywhere. This is one piece. I think there are several pages of the department. That's a little do that every year. Great, thank you. And that um, outlines a lot of uh, the kids' achievements and has updated um, enrollment numbers. We had a couple hundred kids up to 207. And we do um, project to be up to maybe between 2022 and 20, uh, 222 uh, or 232. So for next year. Very good. Great. Anyone have any comments? Thank you, Laura. All right. Great. Now on to finance report, Mr. McNamara. Well, that's a good segue. The budget, uh, we, uh, Superintendent, Mrs. Allen and, and I presented the budget to the budget board on uh, 328. Um, a few questions, uh, nothing uh, too difficult to answer. Uh, but um, I think it might be important if we uh, remind the uh, parents that financial town meeting is on May 17th and try to get them to come out because there's always uh, there always the possibility of a proposal to reduce the budget uh, and that has been in the past so I think the, the more uh, people we get out to vote the better we mm -hmm. are so uh, I would encourage that it's also baseball season I know in past years we've been competing with the baseball games I yeah. had to pull her off the field to make a quorum as it stands now the budget will be the school committee approved budget that will be going to the financial uh, town meeting so there were no uh, proposed cuts from the uh, budget uh, commission uh, as far as the current financials, it looks like we're still targeting for a break even for this year. Um, things are moving along. There have been no surprises. A couple of additional expenses that have come up um, in terms of the, uh, the building, but we, sh we should be able to handle those uh, without any issue. So uh, I'm pretty pleased with the way things are going right now. All right. Yeah. Anyone have any questions? Any questions for Mr. McNamara? Mm -hmm. um, on to committee reports. Policy subcommittee report. There is none. Report. Thank you. Um, so since we last met on March eighth, Ports and Civil Committee has met twice. Um, at the March 22nd meeting, they recognized the amazing work done by the Community Service Club. They had an overly, overwhelmingly successful donation drive to support Ukrainian refugees, which I saw pictures of it, and they filled a box truck full of anything that um, they would need. So that was amazing to see. They also discussed their um, the Equity Institute report that came back with their findings and suggestions. So I 
Um, it was very interesting to see the brief overview. So I really encourage everybody to check that out. It's on the Portsmouth School Department's YouTube page, the recorded meeting. Um, it's about like 45 minutes of presentation from the Equity Institute. That was really interesting. Um, and then last night they met as well. They highlighted Portsmouth Middle School, which is celebrating their 50th anniversary this year. So they had performances from the different bands, the chorus, they took a tour of the Ag Innovation Farm that they have going on there. So that was all really cool to see. And then just uh, quickly uh, recognize the winter sport athletes. Um, they had a great season, specifically the Portsmouth High School Boys Indoor Track Sprint Medley team won fourth, fourth place at a national indoor competition. And the math team won third place at a recent competition this past weekend. So amazing things happening there as well um, in Portsmouth. Excellent. Oh, and I also, one last thing that I heard um, today was uh, Principal Amaral of Portsmouth High School is stepping down at the end of the year, which is sad to report that, but. Thanks, Anna. Mm -hmm. um, next up, town. Recreation committee liaison. Yes. Um, just kind of status quo, still waiting on the lighting for the courts. Mm -hmm. um, still working on the project to get the sign for the fields and uh, reparations to the uh, shed outside the baseball field. So, so all right. moving Thank along. <laughs> Thank you. Um, wellness community? Yes. Uh, so we did have a meeting on. March 22nd, as Superintendent Diaz Mitchell mentioned, we reviewed Wellness Week. So I heard about those massages a few times. Yeah. Uh, next year. Next year. Um, there is that fabulous April newsletter with um, kudos to uh, your work. Yeah, so that was wonderful. And uh, we just reviewed in general how things are going, which seem to be doing quite well. Um, again, the, the food services are providing the state's providing um, lunch at no cost and breakfast at no cost, but that will likely end after June. And uh, so we won't have that luxury in the fall. Uh, and then our next meeting is May 10th. And again, I would just implore and encourage parents, please come think about joining the wellness meeting. Um, you know, it's your children's wellness that we're talking about. So really encourage you to get involved and um, stay committed to it. Thank you. Thanks, Rita. Did you say there's no more free lunch? And did I misunderstand you? No, I said that there will be- um, After June. After June, everyone at this point through the pandemic, all students have been provided free breakfast and lunch. Right. However, after June, they will go to the old uh, method of applying for. Families will have to apply for a subsidy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Um, discussion items. Discussion about the high school request for proposal process. I could start with that. John for China. Uh, on April 5th, I sent the RFP and the rubric to every school district within 20 miles of Mansfield, school, uh, 20 apartments. And I have heard back from nearly all of them. Uh, I at first thought that the rubric, which is multiple pages and the ask um, reliant, that it would be uh, a constraint. And I had one district reach out and say, we were accredited on the old standards. So you're using this rubric on the new standards, which we'll be facing in a few years, is kickstarting that process. Um, so we, we should get some very thoughtful, relevant um, proposals that speak to all of these areas outlined. Um, in the uh, accreditation framework, learning culture, student learning, professional practices, learning support, and uh, learning resources. And we all know how long <laughs> the rubric is. There it is, um, quite long. 
And so to hear from a district that they are looking forward to finishing the proposal um, because it will be a draft for their self-study and their, accredit their reaccreditation process. Um, we're expecting our proposals to uh, land on my desk by Friday, April 29th at noon. And you know, with tuition opportunities, RFP number LC, SDHS um, dash T tuition. And any questions or concerns, they can reach out to me or John McNamee. Um, but we'll shut down that process by ne next Monday. I'm available now. And John Anderson is uh, in contact with Ride Legal to find out you know, any other pieces that we may be missing that falls in this wheelhouse. Um, so, so far, so good. We're on target in terms of the timeline that we've presented. What, Paul, if you, what's the next step after April 29th? After April 29th, I've been in contact with a few former NEASC team leaders. Um, one, I was on one of his teams when we did um, a reaccreditation visit uh, at a high school down the Cape. I've been on several. So I do have access to um, consultants. So the next step is to hire a, um, by the hour, you know, a consultant who knows the NEASC framework, who knows what a quality high school is. The one I'm thinking, who can be absolutely objective, um, what I'm thinking of has been a high school principal in both Massachusetts and Rhode Island, and has led several NEASC teams uh, throughout the Northeast. Connecticut, Massachusetts, uh, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Maine, Vermont. So I'm waiting to hear back from him. And he could he will lead us through the process of scoring. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Madam Chairman. Sure. Uh, Lori, in the so 20 mile radius, is that as the crow flies or is that like as a drive? Because like Newport is five miles as the crow flies. Right. But then it's 45 minutes to get to. Yeah. Okay. So we cast a wide net. Just yeah, absolutely. No question. Yeah, but the funniest thing, you know, I, I started with us at the, you know, the wake the first point. Um, and the closest, obviously, is Westport, if, if, if we can cross state lines. Um, but Dartmouth is uh, the next. Well, no, then Chippewa, then Dartmouth, then Portsmouth. So, uh, and obviously, then Middletown and Newport, et cetera. But do I expect proposals from all districts? No. No. Um, one school committee did discuss it last night in the executive session, and uh, they have full bore. So, yeah, I think we're good. John, would you like to? Yeah, I think once the uh, <clears throat> the vetting goes through, uh, we probably narrow it down to probably three that we would then present to the uh, to the public. So there'd probably be an interview process yep. presentation by that group. And then ultimately, this committee would make the uh, final decision. We have some lead time, obviously. We have that wonderful <laughs> emergency one year extension, which was a, a great idea. It you know, gives us some breathing room just in case we hit a wall in the process. That's the way back I hope not. That's the way back with you. Anyone else have anything to add? All right, thank you. Um, um, hey, um, what? Look at you. <laughs> <laughs> but looking at you, Roger. <laughs> right, well, there's a lot of uh, anxiety out there in parent land about uh, what's being taught to the kids regarding gender awareness and all that kind of thing. And uh, I mean, you don't hear too much from any of the schools about it. All you hear is negative talk from parents and I don't know where they're getting that from. So the question is, uh, what's happening in that regard here at Wilbur? 
Right. Lori, do you have anything you want to? Sure. I mean, you know, we uh, we support all children, Roger, and we support all iterations of children's families. And and so there is um, content in our health curriculum, content in the library. You know, we support every child, every um, parent, every guardian, every caretaker. And so that's what's included in a comprehensive education. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure what parents are worried about. Uh, if they have any questions or concerns, they could call uh, me, they could call Mary Elizabeth Miller, who is our clinician, social worker, who certainly has a really good grasp on everything that is covered in advisory in open circle, which is a sort of um, a weekly check in that our little ones do with their teachers and with their guidance counselor. Um, our library has a collection that is wholly inclusive and, uh, and, and supports all reading interests and tastes and levels and any content that kids would be interested in. Um, so I have not received any criticism, hasn't come across my desk um, that is specific or um, actionable. Um, the parents can reach out to me and I'll answer any and all their questions. If I don't have the answer, Mr. McKinnon and his staff could certainly provide that. Uh, so they were worried about what's being taught at Wilbur McMahon School and do they have actual um, examples or just the general um, culture or, or you know what's in the news and in other cities, towns and states? Well, based on what you hear in the, in the news, television, radio, et cetera, uh, 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 parents are very concerned that hmm. some of the teaching extends into proselytizing and uh, hmm. giving kids ideas about things at their age that they normally would not have thought of on their own. And now some people, most people, I guess, are afraid to ask, which is probably why you haven't heard anything. Hmm. So yeah. my suggestion is put out a newsletter or something that would explain what actually happens in the classroom in that regard. Hmm. You know, I, I've been in education for 39 years and I have never encountered um, an educator or specialist that proselytizes or indoctrinates. I've actually encountered uh, the opposite, you know, uh, professional educators who uh, sometimes are at a loss, you know, just how to discuss sensitive topics, um, how, how to, in an age appropriate manner, um, answer kids' questions. Kids are very curious, Roger. Uh, so I haven't received any feedback regarding anyone um, engaged in any sort of teaching that is um, that crosses any boundary that would conflict with um, you know any parents or caretakers um, family culture that they're, they're trying to create. Uh, so. I would encourage them if you, you hear parents' concern to reach out to me or to Principal McKinnon. Okay. Anyone else? <laughs> um, consider you, Roger. You're bringing that to my attention. Consider, discuss, and vote to approve the 2022-2023 Little Compton School District calendar. So we've got the calendar that's been looked at by um, the union. Everyone's look at it, and, and everybody. <laughs> everybody's got to look at it. And while it is on here for a discussion and a vote, um, I don't think we have much say on it. But <laughs> yeah, and and, and, and and you know, I don't think it's um, it doesn't quite fall under the school committee's purview in terms of. You know, an action, but it's just good practice and collaboration and partnering. 
Um, as you all know, it's no surprise. We do sync up with ports. We do not begin drafting until we get there. So of course, Tom and I start in January talking about um, sort of broader issues. So I was on the phone with him uh, today at 4.30. Um, and so this stands, you know, his, his uh, calendar has, but remember we all changed our calendars, Portsmouth and Little Compton late in the game last year. Um, but this one is pretty firmed up. What kind of process does it go through on our end? Both uh, collectives, the LCTA, go. and also the ESP, the support union. Um, and we also, you know, the principal, looking at the quarters and counting the days, et cetera, um, is pretty much in sync with Portsmouth. Start the same day. Uh, their first day of school, they only bring in a partial cohort of kids. Those who are transitioning to, um, you know, school from preschool to kindergarten, from elementary to middle, from middle to high, and that's a lot. That's a, that's more than our whole population. There's no need for us to roll like that because they're here from three to three years old to to fourteen. Um, so we we hit the ground running on that Tuesday, and. Um, no, I think it's it's a it's a good calendar. It's in sync with our Portsmouth um, partners, and we've done away with any kind of aside from that one statewide PD day. We're not doing any kind of statewide calendar anymore, right? Right. So that it was our calendar was very prescriptive the past two years, and now it's not. So we do have more latitude. Um, and so we have that statewide in March and the other PDs we own. And um, so that'll be the, the only day, the one in March where our kiddos will have a distance learning day. The other PD days, they will just have no school. Um, just like the olden days, mm -hmm. as the kids would say. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that it won't change before <laughs> September because we didn't think it would last year, but I'm reasonably certain that it will remain fun. All right, thank you. So um, I would entertain a motion. Oh, oh. So yeah. this refers to snow makeup days. So that's how is that? That's, that's been notated here, and where it wasn't. That's if we right. That's if thank you, Mike. That's if we have a snow day where we don't do DL, and so sorry, um, where you don't do what, please? Distance learning, yeah. right? Yeah. If you do distance learning, uh, if you give the kids a true snow day, which they love, and we may want to think about doing that moving forward. Um, then you need to make up that, you have to finish your 180 uh, and that wouldn't count. So you have to extend your calendar. So um, our, our school year ends um, on June 16th. However, if we have snow days that aren't distance learning days, it will be extended, our school year will be extended. The 20th or the 21st would be the end of the last school day. So I know this is not on the agenda right now, but I guess my question would be is, how do we know what our guidelines are gonna be, whether it's gonna be distance learning or if it's gonna be no school days going forward so that everybody knows what the plan's gonna be going into the school year? Well, I mean, I think the school committee has to decide, do you want to have true snow days? I think what we've done is we've done half and half. We've given the kids uh, some instruction in the morning that covers, um, and, oh. <laughs> and we've, um, so we've, we've had half snow days and they still counted towards our 180 because we did instruction in the morning. So I think a lot of districts, might continue to do that. There might also be days that are unexpected as well. Well, the bomb cyclone in October when the police called me very early in the morning and, and said, you know, all of your bus routes are down. You have trees everywhere. You're not getting buses anywhere. Um, or snow day, you know, a real, you know, an actual snow day that's not just predicted by Channel 12 and Superintendent cohort shuts everything down, <laughs> you know, but uh, we never know. We never know. So some districts want the kids to have real snow days with no instruction. Um, 
that it depends on the culture of the school committee, how you feel about it. Or do you want to continue to offer instruction in the morning? And then the kiddos play in the afternoon and it seems to work. So is that for discussion probably at a future date or how does that? It could be, it, it's, it's, yeah, we could vote on it. You want, we can discuss it now because the calendar is on the agenda, but we can't vote on it now. But. Yeah, so, okay. so I guess, um, so I guess my discussion on that might, would be is to go back to the way it used to be where they actually have a full actual snow day and that they're not, in front of the computer at home for half a day and then the rest of the half they're that they're doing their I rather if it's gonna be a snow day, it's a snow day. If it's one snow day or if it's two snow days, I I just make it up at the end. I'd rather see them get their full potential of actually learning in school versus them being home because it was it was established that kids were not getting the fullest potential through remote learning. So I don't think it's gonna Let's not continue that practice if that's not, if they weren't getting their fullest potential mm -hmm. by doing it at home. That's my my personal feeling um, as far as mm -hmm. hey, if we make up one day, if we make up two days at the end, I'd rather see them get what they need, their, their full education. I don't know when we need to put that forward. That's a, that's a good point. Um, when there were so many PD days, there were six prescribed, and you had snow days, and you had emergencies, mm -hmm. um, like the bomb cyclone. And so, it, yeah, kids were 10, 11 days uh, distance. In the new calendar, it's just that one day, that PD day. And so that does eliminate, as, as Mike pointed out, um, the fact that distance learning is not optimal um, for all kids and um, maybe for most kids. It is the second best you know, way to deliver uh, rather than shutting down the school, of course, uh, and instruction, but um, it's food for thought. And, and I, don't, I don't doubt that. We did what we had to do to get by and, and I understand that and, and we did what we had, uh, again, what we had to, but as of right now, we don't have to do the distance learning to go forward. It's, and that and that's just my thoughts get the most out of are they learning days here in the classroom. I, I don't think you'll find anyone who disagrees with that. Distance learning is not optimal. Uh, I would agree about snow days. Um... But for different reasons, I think that the distance learning program was great given the circumstances. Yeah. Um, but I think that snow days are also a great learning opportunity for kids. Um, getting out there and playing with their friends, hands-on building and playing outside is all really valuable as well. And then I think we can't forget that we have an internet issue in this town as well, that um, if there's heavy snow and half the town's knocked out of power and we do go for a distance learning, then that could amount to only some kids being in class, some kids being able to get on. So I agree that I think we should go back to um, just regular snow days, but we have seen years where we've had five, six, seven snow days. And I think in that event, maybe once we get past three snow days, maybe yeah, so we start like thinking yeah. about distance learning days, but maybe the first few are true snow days. I like that. Yeah. As a skier, uh, as an educator. <laughs> Chair Matt. Yes. Yep. I echo both uh, Michael and, and Hannah's sentiment. I think that we're much better um, if we're all or none. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with the storm, as Hannah stated, you flip a coin, depending on where you are in town, to have a distance learning day just wouldn't seem right. But I do like the idea of a threshold so that we're not <laughs> going to July. <laughs> God forbid, you know, you know, mother nature, you never know. So uh, I would like to get away from it. But at the same time, uh, if we do find ourselves in a blizzard type event or a nor'easter type event where we're several feet, several trees down, but bus routes are problematic for days, if, if not a week, then maybe we, we do a pivot. But um, I'm in agreement with both Hannah and Michael on that. 
If I may, sure. Madam Chair, I, I agree with everything that's being said. And I also want to point out that we've invested in this infrastructure. Everybody has a Chromebook. We mm -hmm. have the ability to do it. Mm -hmm. So let's not worry about it. If, if uh, again, to. sketchy service here and there, but we, we built it into our uh, way of managing our school. So let's not give it up entirely. Right. And when we need to use it, we have it. We have a great um, infrastructure with a great leader in our IT. That is for sure. So, anyone else? So we asked, what would be our next step to actually vote on that? What would be the process on that? Yeah, so um, we'll just put it on an agenda. We'll work out. Um, yeah. I'll probably run it by... Um, John Anderson, just as to wording and whether it needs to be a policy or if it can just, I'll, I'll run it by John Anderson and see what the next step will be, but it will either be um, in a policy committee meeting coming up or on an agenda within the next few months, say a couple months, if I may. I think some school committees have tackled this. Um, okay. Motion to approve the 2022-2023 Little Compton School Department calendar. So moved. Second. Well, I think I made the motion. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, wow. Oh, oh, so I'm so yeah. No, I made the motion. <laughs> so, <that's> so. <laughs> Travis liked well, it. I just, it out. I don't know if I was <laughs> like it. Come on, Mike. Mariah, do you need <laughs> more <laughs> clarification? <laughs> I think I got that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all, right, all right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, motion carries. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, consider, discuss, and vote to approve a $500 donation to Portsmouth's Parents Helping Students Organization, PHSO, in support of the PHS class of 2022. Um, in the past, we have made a donation for this amount um, directly for the post-prom event, um, but with things unclear, um, we're not actually sure that that is what is going to happen if there's going to be a post prom event, but it will go towards some end of year activity for the um, the kids, the students of the class of 2022. Um, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, motion carries. Consider, discuss, and vote to approve any other requests for information from administration and or legal counsel. Anyone have anything they want here? Okay, super. Um, so right on 9-4, we have consider and vote to enter into executive session. Um, for under RIGL section 4246-5A2. Um, John Anderson couldn't be here and um, we've had no motion on the collective bargaining. So if no one has any objections, I am going to table executive session. Anyone have any objections with that? No, yeah, nothing has changed. Right? No, okay, super. Um, <laughs> All right, I would consider a motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Hannah and John, thank you, everyone. Thank you.